Okay, today is March the 27th, 2013. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. And I'm in Stillwater today to speak with Dr. Garrett yeah. Cooperus. That's very Cooperus, yes. Cooperus. So thank you for having us today. And we'll start with learning a little bit about you. Um, our focus today is the mezzanine, but let's first learn a little bit about your background and then we'll work our way forward until your paths cross with the mezzanine. Um, let's start with when, where you were born, and a little bit about your childhood. I was born June 2nd, 1956 in Heron Lake, Minnesota. And I was born and raised on a farm. I wasn't born on a farm, but I was raised on a farm. In, we had dairy cattle and, and a lot of land and always pigs and sheep. And what were some of your chores around the farm? My job was always feeding animals. And I also got to help with the farm work and that was pretty fun. And how early would you have to get up to do that? Well, uh, when you milked cows, they'd be up at six or so. But my dad always loved me until I was older. He let me sleep in, and because he school was always a very important to him. So you didn't have to milk before you went to school. No, I did not. Just after. Actually, after I turned. Did you have brothers and sisters? I had two brothers and two sisters, and. My sisters, one's a lawyer and one's a doctor, a medical doctor. And they live in, one lives in Wisconsin, one other one lives in Texas. So you're about halfway in between then? Halfway in between. My two brothers are both farmers in Minnesota. And where are you in the birth order? I'm in the middle, in the middle. right in the middle. Two older sisters, two younger brothers. Well, did your parents go to college too? No. My mother was a nurse, but she she did not complete her degree. She got married instead. And my father was a farmer. Had their parents farmed too? They had both their parents were farmers. And how many acres did they farm? They were fairly small farms, a couple hundred acres. And but that was their primary source of income. It was was farming. Okay, so in high school, were you in 4-H or FFA? I was not. I just never had that opportunity. Well, being from the farm, most I thought you might have been. I probably should have been, but I, I just never had that. Never had anybody try to talk to me about it. Well, did your school have them? I, but not I, all schools did. No, apparently they did not. Okay. So in high school, what were you thinking you would want to do for your career? I knew I was going to go to college, and I, I, and I would do something. Primary reason because I, I didn't want to milk cows the rest of my life. <laughs> so that, that definitely made a blade run of me, and I, I was sure I would not grow up to be a, a farmer because I, it was an awful lot of work. <laughs> And then after college, I went to the U.S. Peace Corps, and that's how I got into integrated pest management, which was my job at OSU. Pest management? And uh, I really got so I turned on by that in the Philippines. We lived during the equator, and everything was live year-round, and, and pests were quite, quite a deal. Pests, including rats and insects, it was quite a tough to raising crops over and not running the equator like that. And I, what a battle. And I came back, I sure I wanted, that's the career, I wanted to work in dealing with pests. So where did you go for your undergrad then? My undergrad, I was at University of Minnesota, Morris. Okay. And then I did, I did two years in the Peace Corps. And then I, after that, I came back and went to main campus, University of Minnesota in St. Paul, Minnesota, and did my master's and PhD there. Both. And worked and focused on integrated pest management. So it's kind of fun. Well, did being in the Peace Corps help you pay for the 
master's and PhD then? No, but it allowed me to focus on getting, making sure I was mentally prepared. You know, it really did, it was perfect to preparation for graduate school. And your two brothers stayed on the farm. They did. And your two sisters got it, went off. Are they, are your brothers on the same farm your parents had? Yes, they are. Okay. We're close to it. Close to it. That now their farm probably five or ten times as much as my dad did. And so... Just it, to make a living, you've had to increase acreage. And, and, mm -hmm. But they have machining now that allows it to be done relatively quick and easy and, and stuff. In a whole different world, and it was a generation ago. That's a question we ask our farmers is, do you remember your first time you got to drive the tractor? Yeah, the first time I ever drove a tractor went through a fence. Because <laughs> <laughs> my dad and I were going to get a new baby calf and then and he carried the calf back and I, I got to drive the tractor and I drove right through a fence. <laughs> About how old were you? Five. And you were driving a tractor at five. Well, that, you could be excused then for driving it through the fence. Yeah, it was kind of amazing. I remember that. I always remember that. I was so scared. Well, did but he fuss at you for doing that? No, he didn't. <laughs> he did not. He probably said, well, what do you expect a five-year-old? Right. So once you started, you didn't stop? That's it. That's it. Did your uh, mother raise chickens? Oh, she always had chickens. That was one of the jobs the little kids cook, get the eggs. So they she always had chickens. Did she did she butcher them for frying chicken? Yeah, we always butchered. That was once a year we we did chickens, and that, that was that was all the family where I, grandparents had come and and we'd all participate in. We do that one solid day and butchered all the chickens. A hundred or more? or oh, Often there was that many. A lot of work. And do you eat chicken today? Yes, I do. <laughs> some don't. I was, so I'm just curious. <laughs> I like chicken. I always did. Did they have a certain method of doing the butchering? Yeah, they did. Everybody had their job. Our, my job was always helping get the feathers off. Okay. But my dad always cut the heads off, and and then we went from there, and, and my job was always to help get the feathers off. And at that point, I guess they had a deep freeze at the farm. And we did, okay. and afterwards, we, the was left with the chicken going that deep freeze. Okay. So... Okay, once you graduated with your PhD, where was your first job? My, my first job was at Oklahoma State University. You know, I it's kind of bizarre, but I hadn't planned on graduating for a year. And then I said, it's a great job. Something got, it was an integrated pest management, and it's a perfect job for what, what I wanted to do. And I talked to my advisor, and, he said, go for it. We'll, we'll finish up if we need to be. So I interviewed and got that job, and then I had to really scramble because I hadn't started writing yet. ABD, huh? Yeah, but, <laughs> but I, so I, I was a pretty busy man for the last six months. Sure. But, so I finished it up, and I started it July 1st, 1982. Yeah. My wife was pregnant at the time, so we moved down here. Lots of fussing and lots of hubbub. A lot of changes really quick. It, it was. Yeah. So you you didn't have any other any other uh, job options or not options really, but that was it. This was the first job you interviewed, and you got it, and you stayed. Yeah, I didn't, and that's been. A hundred years ago. <laughs> I started in 1982. 
That's a long time ago. Well, you worked in pesticides. Do any particular or no, pest Pe management, not pesticides? I worked. At, I focused a lot of my career with insects, weeds, and d diseases, all the different pest areas. And if anything, I ended up working post harvest as grain storage and food processing, pest management. And we've got a, a center at Oklahoma State University toward product research and extension center. It's brand new facility and that's west of town. If you go west, you see these huge green bins there mm -hmm. and that's what that is. So you worked some with the Cooperative Extension near near part of OSU? My job was primarily extension. Okay. And, uh, and I started at 100% extension and then later my career changed to 25% research and 75% extension. But, you know, it's, my job was to focus programs in extension for farmers in, in dealing with pests in their management. I was reading online when I was preparing for this, you did something with alfalfa farmers. And then, uh, and that was always fun. I enjoyed alfalfa farmers. They were neat people. Something about having a first auction uh, online or something. We did Haymarket, which is a, a marketing pro program for alfalfa. Because alfalfa, when I was a kid, you raised it permanently to feed it to your own animals. But here, we raise it and sell it all over the U.S., US but permanently to Texas, to big dairies down there. Mm. So we started that program, and that's kind of a fun program to be involved with. Pretty big business. It was. So what was the main pest that you studied? Well, I did a lot of work with alfalfa weevil and alfalfa, but in grain storage, we focused a lot of our work done on insect pests that infest grain in processing. A lot of pests like a lesser grain borer and rusted grain beetle, anemia moth. So that's what we did a lot of our work on. A lot of our farmers talk about grasshoppers. Did you have to do the work with them? We never really didn't know much because, but uh, it's a great thing to begin a bigger problem, but we just didn't worry about them in those days. Well, once you uh, got to OSU, you decided to stay, obviously. Did you at any point decide to look somewhere else besides here? I, I interviewed a couple of places and I got a, I had a job offer from Texas. They wanted like a, a deaning we knew. <laughs> so, and then they want, I, I was really embarrassed because they interviewed my wife and I because they, or afraid that that the wife would limit what she, how many people you can get, and my wife absolutely hated the place. And she said, "You take a job, you go alone." <laughs> <laughs> so I turned it on. But the enemy went fine, except for my wife. So, so in the early eighties. Was the, the dairy? Now the dairy building was still here it at was. that point. Did you do any any work in there? No, I did not. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to go there near there for coffee once in a while. Cause in those days, my office is in Life Sciences West. Okay. So I, I was fairly close to the dairy bar. Mm -hmm. So I was told they had good ice cream. 
the work of that. It was really fun to go there. Okay, so the reason we're here today is the mezzanine. Tell me how you got involved with with it. Well, my job was when I first came to us, he was then the good pest management coordinator and pests are very strong and regulated by climatic conditions. And it's perfect. And I did some work with climatic issues where they did pass like day degree models and, and things like that. And so it's natural that I participate in. And we all, all we helped organize a symposium of full day thing, Ron Elliott and, and company and I, myself helped organize and one day symposium on implementation of climatic models and in integrated pest management. And so we helped organize that and, and that went over pretty well and that was the first part of our ORSU effort. So it's kind of fun. We did that and pulled it off and went on there pretty well with our fellow faculty members. So that was held here on at OSU versus OU. Yeah. And then, you know, interesting, OU had similar efforts going on and then we didn't really merge, or at least I didn't, for till the governor got involved and so why don't you guys get organized and you form that cooperative effort between those two and and it seemed logical to everybody involved so Ron Elliott part of was doing that before but I was not before that. So the three from OSU was yourself, Sadler. Ron Elliott, and Dr. Stadler. Yeah, that's it. Okay. And then OU had three. Howard Johnson. Um, Ken Crawford. Crawford. And then the third one, I can't remember what that was. I'm not sure. Do you, I mean, I don't know if it was Dr. Brock, but I don't think he was initially. He may have came on a little bit. Oh, later, but I, I'm not sure. I'll have to look it up. Ken Brock was involved, but he might not have been the first representative from OU. Right. Okay. He was, yeah, I think it was. The, the Ken Brock was the, was the sixth. Was the sixth. Okay. So we met for several years. I was sixth. And you'd go there, they come here, or alternate? Well, alternated, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to go to, to see all you because I had only been there a couple of times and, and all of a sudden we go there every, every couple, two times a month. And it's pretty fun. Well, two times a month, that's pretty, pretty, a large commitment on time too. It was. And at the time I, I was awful busy in my job and so it's quite a, quite a sacrifice to sure and that was you were probably tenured by that time but still I was I was tenured but it still was quite a quite a contribution of time we needed a lot of talking and a lot of discussing how to do this and how to do that That's right. mm -hmm. and then you know then in between the meetings you'd have people talked about it and why are they looking at this? Why aren't you guys doing this? And why aren't you doing it this way? And so I had lots of lots of people ask for that. And that was before internet and email. It was. You had to do phone calls or That's a, or I guess snail mail. Very little snail yeah, mail, but little. but I get a lot of calls. Extension work's busy enough, and then add this on top. That's it. That's kind of. I was one with the guy at that time. My work at the time was. I was knee deep in things to do. So I was a pretty busy person, but so was everybody else. So. 
Well, how did your role on the Mesonet project impact your other work? I think it greatly helped it, you know, because alfalfa, we ended up implementing various models in my regular work that came from Mesonet. So I really helped facilitated it very well. I was very pleased. And uh, in the middle of that, I'd been involved with Washington, D.C., and I'd been the, the national program leader for integrated pest management for all of ESD. And then, so, I, and then we got a grant because of that. But it all ties in together and, and not much sleep. My first day, I was a pretty busy person in those days. So your your daily work impacted what you contributed to the mezzanine and then and then it contributed it's kinda of like a big cycle then. And a big circle that's there. And then it scratched my back and I helped it scratch theirs. <laughs> so it worked out pretty well. You used some of it to do presentations and papers and such. Yeah. We published several articles in which because of the medicine that helped help fulfill that part of it. So it worked out pretty well all over um, And and <coughs> how long how long did you stay on the are you still you're not still on the steering committee? No I'm not I was on the steering committee I'm not sure exactly why that's bar Probably five years. That's and that's a long time too, though. It is a long time, and they're busy years. So it's kind of fun. And have you been out to many of the sites, the actual been, sites? Yes, I have. And so I was involved with them when they were first selecting sites. Okay. So and how did that work? Well, I didn't really get involved in site selection. We had people hired to do that, mm -hmm. so. But uh, it's kind of interesting when we got together a couple of weeks. We'd uh, hear the stories about select sex sex selection and how they have positive and negative experiences. I'm assuming they turned down a few. They did, did they? but a lot of times that their people really. Were, or positive about making sure that they got to a crux site and everything worked. Well, with with the extension, did you have to talk it talk the county agents or extension workers into the pros and cons of this? Um, most of them were super enthusiastic, and you know, and I don't think I had to talk them into it. It certainly calm them down a little bit, more of the case. Most of them are very supportive of the ideas. And, and I could see how it would be useful for them and, their, and the people in their county in the long run. So I, I was very pleased that most of our county agents and stuff were super supportive of the efforts. They had to go back to the farmers and explain how they could use it? In in uh, the local decision makers, the local mayors and people in the county, they needed to explain to them how it would be of value to them, and how it would be of use to them. And I was very pleased to hear how receptive they were. Sure. They were very. I was very pleased to with the how, how supportive they were of the efforts. Were you involved with the, the at the time period that they were going to talk to Governor Bellman? Yes, I was. I was involved. In, I went under the the first meeting with Dr. Bellman, and that was quite impressive. We met at the state capitol, and, and I was very pleased. Bellman had better comprehension of what we could accomplish than any of us did. Mm -hmm. I was very pleased. Well, and he was all for OU and OSU working together. 
He was. Mm -hmm. He had more, he was more receptive than anybody I'd ever met before. And he was ready to go. Well, plus he was a farmer. I think that may have been the biggest help. I agree. And he, he certainly believed in extension services mm -hmm. and what we could do. And that has been very, very positive thing. Do you remember getting the phone call that said, money's coming? Yeah, I did. That was quite a, I delighted me. That was a very, very positive day. Mm -hmm. $2.7 million. That was a nice nest egg to start with. Sure. And then you had to get busy and... Make sure it doesn't <laughs> use correctly. That's right. 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 But that's a... Well, Ron Allard helped a lot. He made sure everything was done right and done correctly and everything was perfect. Well, just six of you. At that time, were there more people involved than just the six of you? There was it's a, a lot of people involved, but the six, we had to, we got blamed or credit for what <laughs> depends on the name, but it was kind of fun. Yeah, and here we are 20 years later, and it's still going. It is. Bigger, it's, bigger even, I guess. It's really good to see. It's kind of neat. So, and I, I talked to Alistair Sutherland Alfred, and he's, he's work involved with that. He's hired by Manson, a former faculty member at LSU. And he was the extension, or is it? He Something was, to do with extension. He was an extension horticulture at it first started in Chickasha and mm -hmm. and then he became a mezzanine at staffers and on faculty at OC. So it's always gonna be neat to see. I understand they have over thirty people employed now. I do. It's kinda of amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Did you envision it staying this long when you were first started? I Always envisioned it, it as a, had the potential of, of growing quite big. And I, I, I always hoped it would. And I always thought it would, but there were days when I wondered it. <laughs> but I was very pleased to see it grow as much as it has. It's a lot of data. It is. Tons of data. Mm -hmm. They always have that, that amount of data on the tip of their tongue, and, and I'm amazed how much stuff they... There's 10 minutes of observations for all the sites. That's an unbelievable amount of data. And I can't imagine how many different ways it's used, but yeah. I know it's used a lot of different ways. It's, um, especially by classes and and you saw it, we did a lot of in extension efforts in both with cotton, alfalfa, stored grain, mm -hmm. wheat. Every time we have an early frost, early freeze, or hard freeze. I'm wondering if, you know, 10, 20 years from now, they'll use some of this data to, to work on global warming. Well, I would think so. I would think it would, could be. And now we have, we have long-term records for this. So it, it has to be used. It's kind of neat to see. Mm -hmm. Taking up a lot of space on some server somewhere. It is. That, when you all started, it wasn't, was it was it pen and paper? Or, well, there may have been com some computer use at that time. It was. In the early 90s. But it, it isn't near what it is now. Mm -hmm. Now it's unbelievable, needy numbers. So it's kind of neat to see. Do you know how they came up with the name? I'm pretty sure Meza is broad spectrum, and net, they're all tied into a network. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure that's how the, word, the terminology came about. Ask Granella if he would know for sure. I, I, yeah, I think that's similar to what he said, but uh, <laughs> it's a little bit different from each. Each perspective is a little bit different. Yeah. 
did other did other states I know that have they come to see what we do here? Yeah, a lot of states have come and and a lot of states have mimicked us and have copied us, but the limitation almost always is the one shock of money, two point seven million dollars to buy equipment and get it started. Nobody come up up and then chuck a money like that. And, and we got it because Bellman saw the potential and, you know, it was all overcharge money. And, and every state had that amount of money given back back to them. But it, takes, it took some Mike Bellman to make sure he saw the light and where they gave everybody five cents, you know, because that's what it would have been if you would divide that up with two million people, it would be not much money to everybody. But, you know, you can see why, why you did this. And it was kind of neat to see him do it. Sure. Goldman had foresight enough to see that it needed to be done. And, and in this way, it would help all of us for a long time. Every county. Or Every county, every county in the state has at least one mezzanite site. That's going to need to see. That is. Uh, that's, everybody has an investment. Exactly. In you know, when we have a, a problem like drought or early freeze or wind damage, everybody has a piece of the data too. And it's kind of amazing to see. So funding was one of the biggest issues. And once that hurdle was over, what was the next issue? Oh, always a continuing issue is how do you maintain this, the, how do you maintain the equipment and update it in the state? And, and we're fortunate to get good state support for that. Mm -hmm. And then, we get enough user fees to help stimulate new projects and ideas of people that use the data correctly and, and do a nice job with that. Nowadays, how often do you visit the site, the the website, the MetaNet website? Oh. I probably once a week. Or when a storm's coming? Yeah, or a storm's coming. Or we have a crisis like an earlier freeze. I've got resident and that, that's quite fun to do that. To get pull up a local data, that's kind of fun. I understand a part of it is K-12 education. It is. I haven't had anyone talk too much about that. Do you do you have anything to, to say about that part of it? Other than that, it's great to see that seeds planted for the youth and see them, the parts of climate, it, it started when the kids are little. And my kids, when they were young, they had a good appreciation for medicine and, and it was kind of neat to see. Mm -hmm. Nowadays they can, they add visuals. They do. To, can do do nice things with it. That's quite nice. And uh, it's kind of neat to see that brought in the classrooms and high schools and stuff. One neat thing is now the capabilities, the neat computer applications they have. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of neat to see the tremendous usage in high schools. Well, it, do you have any role with it nowadays? This now? At this point, no, I do not. Other than I, I see Howard Johnson in a wrestling match, and we we talk about it. And Howard, Howard does not have too much involvement since he retired a couple of years ago. But you still understand the value of it. Yeah, I'm still mm -hmm. appreciate that value, and, mm -hmm. and and it's really. Some of the applications are really valuable.
and you see a usage of unbelievable amounts of usage, valuable to people. What makes it so unique though? What does Oklahoma as an it have versus other states around like Colorado or? We have a site in every county and it's done right in the centers are perfectly calibrated. Everything is put together the way it's supposed to be. And and we maintain the census and everything has to be done correctly and it is and a lot of that it's due to the efforts of Howard Johnson and Kid Crawford. They made sure that it's done correctly. Most of us would not have been that conscientious, but they were. They were absolutely sure that you kept that equipment up to date. Correct and consistent. And correct and consistent and always perfect. So making sure that, that everything worked and worked well. Well, that in itself takes money to have someone trained to do that. Yeah, it does. And, that, and making sure that if any, if any sensor started going bad, it, it notified the people at OU that 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 side in that center has a problem and it needs to be fixed tomorrow. It's kind of neat to see. Yeah, well, so there's over a hundred, well, there's 77 counties, so at least. There's over a hundred, hundred sites, because some of them are like, oh, I see where it's multiple sites. And Stillwater and Oklahoma City, and I think we offered people to, you know, they are funded to build additional sites like some of them have. I like Noble Foundation that has a site on their location. I should know that, but I think we're over 100 sites now. Okay. I had read 117 and 120 and 107, so I don't know. Oh, no, Over sure. 100. Over 100. That's right. Well, we'll do. I can be more precise. I'll look at the website. <laughs> that's right. Well, where do you see it going in the next 20 years? Uh, I see my applications. My, my, my concern from the day one, make sure we have applications. And uh, part of that was my job, but I, when I, work, I was involved working for extension, so I, I would make sure we have applications. And that was my concern when I was on the steering committee. Let's make sure people appreciate it and know the applications, and let's make sure that we generate enough applications to make people appreciate it. So they could in turn get more funding, I yeah, guess. That, I'll, that's true, but yeah, I want to make people believe that this is very valuable to their livelihood and their, their life. But in that safety-wise, it has to be a critical factor. Mm -hmm. and, and it is right now. Every time I have a tornado or a flood or freezer, anything like that, we have the mess and the data available. So some of the main users would be farmers, researchers, I guess. And then the general public, every time I, I freeze, or uh, um, my favorite thing is every time I have a, a catastrophe, a weather-related catastrophe, mess and the data was available to help people understand what happened and why it happened and, and what it meant to people. Like the tornado that came through in, what, 99 and, and more? Is that? Hmm. Or the freeze that happened, you know, and every time we, we lose our peach crop, understanding how, how bad it was and ways to prevent it in the future. And that data has to go back to the 
legislature at some point, I guess, if they get more funding from the state. That's right. Yeah. So it's going to need to see it. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite memory from those early days when you were involved with the steering committee? My favorite, I think a lot about is we, we laugh about who gets to ride with Steve Sadler. <laughs> Steve Sadler to the, who's going to be here fitting today? So that's kind of funny. But my favorite meeting, we, we talked about, we would call the meetings and I would, get laughter because I, I was, I would say, tell me what it's going to mean to the people, mm -hmm. you know, tell me how it's going to be of value to somebody. And they used to poo me that uh, Doughty Thomas and stuff, and I said, well, I don't want to be involved if it's not going to be meaningful to people. Mm -hmm. And say, it's going to be a, I'll get you a book chapter in a second. You can, Al Sullivan wrote in a book chapter that that he heard that Gary Cooper was always talked about, let's make sure this is valuable. People use it. And it's kind of funny. Well, I mean, that was your role, and then the other one was, let's make sure the accurate the data is accurate. So, I mean, it's all the puzzles that came together, yeah, pieces, right. pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, there, you know, that, that was true about a person that student could be, everybody, everybody had, had the role, and, and it really worked well when everybody participated. So. And it's camaraderie between the two. It was. People learn to be very respectful and supportive of each other. It was great fun. And any disagreements? Always. <laughs> but everybody just learned to say, well, it ha happens. Let's yes. make sure we don't get caught up in, in, in this stupid stuff. Just talk it out, huh? And talk it out. And, and so it never really got too bad. It doesn't seem like there was much politicking going on either. There wasn't. And part of it because most of the people were scientists. And, mm -hmm. and, and I was probably the one, only one that worried about politics. But everybody else says that let's stick to science. And, and our, you know, if we're going to have senses, let's pick the right sensor and not worry about the, the other stuff. Coming from the extension background, though, you wanted to make sure. And make sure everybody people could use it. Mm -hmm. And those variables are on. So. Would you be able to tell them how it could be used, or you just wanted the, science, the other group to figure that out? My could Contention is I could see where it would be useful, even if we didn't have the application yet. I could see how it would be, in you know a lot of them by, like managing the alfalfa bill. We developed that. I just graduated and that helped develop that, and you could see before and how it would, how it could be done. And but it's really good to see it. And now it's useful. If you ever have you ever talked to Phil Mulder mm -hmm. on campus? Mm -hmm. Phil is department chair in entomology and plant pathology and all. And he he's the one that did a lot of work with alfalfa weevil. Okay. And he he really helped implement medicine and stuff. And you might give Phil a call. And Cover talked to him. He 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 did a very nice job on application. You just get the word out there. That's right. And he did. It's good to see. Him. When was the when was the last time you were at the 
at the uh, National Weather Center. Yeah, it's been out there two years ago. Because okay. uh, I'm part of a OLLIC on campus. Do you know about Lifelong Learning? Oh, oh sure, Lifelong Learning Institute. Uh -huh. And we, we took a trip down to Noble Foundation, no, to a, to the Weather Center, and we went down there, and that was kind of fun. I talked to Renee Doherty there, mm -hmm. and it's kind of fun. Have you met her? I have. Uh -huh. You ever met her? No. Oh, she's a neat lady. She is. We actually taught a class on oral history for her for as part part yeah. of Ollie a few years ago. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. When did, did you do that here in campus? Mm -hmm. yeah. We at the public library. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. I, I bet you I, will, I attended that. We may have another one soon. It's, it's been a while oh, since cool. we did that. I'm pretty sure I was there, <laughs> but I, it's been, what, two, four years ago? Probably at least three or yeah. so back. I think I was there. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> well, you've had a pretty good run with the Mezzanet then. I have. Mm -hmm. It's been very fun. And I, I've really enjoyed being a part of that. And you retired in... 2003. 2003. But you're still keeping up with it. I am. That's because uh, I could see the value for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's easier to be supportive when you can see it, how it positively influences the people. Mm -hmm. And every day I watch the weather stations on TV that talk about using meds and that. It's kind of neat to see. It's a good good program for Oklahoma to have. It is. You mm -hmm. know, uh, was it for Bellman that one that happened? He was the one that, that saw that a petition of OU and OSU working together and pulling us off. And this thing seemed to be at the right place at the right time. And that's it. Right. And he George. had to chuck up money that he had available, and he just made sure it got used correctly. And the ones who got to use it knew what they were doing. That's right. That's right. Most of the time, anyway. <laughs> in, in, and the rest of us in there heard them too badly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of fun being involved. Well, is there anything else you want to add before we close off? No, I'm no. fine. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it.